want to give you all the glory and honor this morning. And as we open up our hearts and our minds, Father God, and as we focus everything to you, and as we give you glory in our praise and our worship, we give you everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First song, Stephen, training. trade for joy today. <laughs> I want to stay in bed, but you know what? It's an intentional, and you have to make the decision we're going to trade. But the song, it really is about what happened on the cross. There's a trading trade that happened that Christ has done for us 2,000 years ago, and we can do that this morning. You know, whatever we're going through, we just say, Lord, I'm going to trade everything, Lord, for the joy of the Lord. We'll do that again. And see, we just be quick and change it so I don't have to look to you.
So David went up to bring up the ark of God to the house of Obed-Edom, to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, they sacrificed the bull and the fat calf. Wearing a linen outfit, David was dancing before the yes. Lord with all his might. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place and in the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed the burnt offering and a fellowship offering before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Lord, we thank you that as David, Lord, was dancing before you, Lord, because your presence now, Lord, was coming to them into the, temp uh, into the tent of the living God. We thank you, God, that we have more joy and more, uh, a better covenant to dance before, Lord, this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, we are in the temple of God, and you are here among us, Lord. Yes. We thank you, God, for the mercy seat, Lord, and the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. that gives us a new way in, Lord. As David, Lord, was excited in the old covenant, how much more, Lord, should we be excited in the new covenant, Lord, Amen. that you took all our transgressions, Lord, 
you had mercy on us, God, and we come by faith this morning, and we will dance and worship before you, Lord, Hallelujah. in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to bless your name this morning, Lord. We want to dance in our spirits before you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise your name. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Christ alone. Thank you, Jesus. Our true foundation is only in Christ alone. We worship you, Lord. Christ alone. My hope.
Bless the Lord, all you hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. We want to bless you today, Lord. Yes, we love you, Lord. Bless you are Lord. awesome. You are majestic in power. Yes, you are faithful to you. all your promises. You will fulfill everything that you have decreed. And Father, we thank you for the promise of eternal life in you, Lord. We thank you for the cross, Jesus. That cross. Declare together, church. He has done great things. It's the same word he has done. He has done. great things you know at times a lot of times sometimes when I'm weary and when I'm discouraged and I can remember that word and let's say he has done great things and if we just focus our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ how good he is and that we can say bless the Lord oh my soul I encourage you this morning as we sing this song again, just Lord, let me just come back to the place that you have done great things. I know it's tough times that I'm going through right now, whatever it is that we are facing, and yet we can just go back to the promises of God's word and that he said, he is a good God and he has done great things. And if we can only count our blessings, you know, we start counting our blessings, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, there's something that happens within our soul and therefore David understood it. And therefore David, when he said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, whatever it is within me, within my soul, bless his holy name. Forget about what is happening around me. Forget about the thing that's maybe impossible, maybe hopeless situation. And yet we can say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And I just encourage us today before we end our worship here. And we will come into the place. God, bring me into the place. And that I can see your goodness in everything. I can see your goodness in everything. Bless the Lord. Oh my.
before you're going to do it again. Father, I just pray for each and every one of us here today. Even for the bad news that we receive, that I receive, and it's personal, very personal. And yet, my mind just, I just choose. No, no, I'm going to go to God's word. And I'm going to say, bless the Lord. O oh, my soul, and all oh, that is within me, bless his holy name. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to allow the anxiety to come and take over because I know that God's word is powerful. And God's word is life to us. And Father, today, that's why this song is just meant so much to me this morning. Because I've learned that I can trust him in everything. And Father, I just pray for each and every one of us here. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know, Father God, anxiety maybe and fear or maybe troubles or maybe news that trouble them. And yet I'm reminded of what Jesus said. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God and also believe in me. And I chose that this week, Lord. I said, I'm not going to be troubled at the news that I've heard. And it's very unsettling and upsetting. I'm not going to dwell in that. Because I know, I know that God is in control of everything. And so therefore, I can rejoice this morning. Not allowing the fear, not allowing the worry to come and take over. But I know that God has the victory of all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. God bless you all. Amen. Any other announcements? Yes. If you're free on a Wednesday night and you said, I'd love to know if there's any Bible study on. I was talking to two Americans who were here last week because, you know, it's summertime. We do get the people coming through. And uh, he said, I was very excited to hear that you are doing the book of Revelation because a lot of churches won't go near it. I said, why not? He goes, because there's so many different views. And... <laughs> And that can mean there could be a collision of thoughts and uh, you might, well, nobody in our Bible studies went out with a black eye, but, but it's almost like, well, look, we're going to have to just accept the fact that different views are going to be here and I want to hear them all. I haven't made a settled decision on any one of these things. There's so many different views, but I just say, I want to hear it all first. Let me hear it all first. And we're certainly getting that. Let us hear it all first and then we can maybe... When the dust settles, as, as if it ever settles, then we can then we can sort of go, all right, now I get a bit of an idea of where we're going. So on Wednesday night, we hopefully will proceed a little bit further into Revelation chapter 12. <laughs> and we might even get it finished. You never know. But it's a very interesting chapter. Amen? Amen. And if there's anyone who's having a birthday and we don't know about it, or any special occasion, then... I know it's probably uh, six weeks child and I, or six months. How old is your child and I, Tommy? No, he, he, my wife's two years uh, today in Ireland, two years. Oh, two years living in Ireland. Oh. Very good. Very good. Um, yes, and uh, don't forget, we've, um, I was reminded there during the week, um, there, there's uh, so many ways that people are sharing their faith, uh, and... Um, Larry and Larry's faithful going out with the gospel of John. I know Jack does as well. And tracts, I mean, how many tracts are going out into Kerry? Like never before. But also, not just tracts, like we're not just giving them away like smarties, but we are giving them intentionally to people who we're sharing the gospel with. Amen. And Larry's been not only sharing the gospel with people, but even leading people to Christ. And actually, isn't that what we do every time we're sharing the gospel? We are supposed to, if someone asks me, how many people did you point to Christ? I said, every one of them. I point them to Christ. I don't know where they're going to be after that, you know, they get home that night and they may pray in their own bedroom. They might say, Lord, I've heard the gospel today. I don't know. But I'm pointing every single person to Christ as the answer. Amen? Amen. 
But it's a real joy when you hear about somebody who's actually uh, come to faith in Christ. And so there are people who have done that through people like Larry and others' ministry, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to get the details on that. Amen. So listen, let's pray for this word. Um, Lord God, I thank you for your word, which never changes, even though the circumstances change and the people who are speaking might change, but your word never changes. And we ask that the spirit of the Lord would minister it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So like I said, it wasn't supposed to be me speaking this morning, but it is the 30th of July. And today we are going to look at Psalm 30. On the 30th of July. I almost predicted that was going to happen anyway because <laughs> I kind of thought well if it happens that's what's going to be we're going to be looking at. Okay so Psalm 30 and if you look at the title in your Bible it you will see um, a song a psalm a song at the dedication of the house of David and uh, I'm not saying that these uh, little subtitles are actual scripture or that they're inspired but it is good to note why they are there and i don't want to go into too much detail because there's not a lot of detail there but david apparently wrote this psalm in the hope that it would be used at the dedication of the temple in the future because he wasn't around when it was actually built According to 2 Samuel 7, 13, it was his son who was the one who built it. But in 1 Chronicles 22, you'll see a whole list of things that David prepared for the, for the building of the temple. He got it all ready. All his son has to do is build it. So this was probably intended for use at the dedication of the temple. And in some sense, it's, it's no specifics, so it could be used at any time. Okay, so Psalm 30, and the first three verses read these words. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Now, in your title, it's of the Bible, it says the blessedness of answered prayer. And it's not just any answered prayer. It is specifically, as you see in those three verses there, a prayer of thanksgiving for healing. Okay, does it not say there? I will extol you, Lord, for you've lifted me up. Where were you? Well, I was down. If you were getting lifted up, it must mean you were down. Right? So it's good to be brought up from where you were down. Not only that, but it says, and if not, let my foes rejoice for me. It's as if his foes were saying, let's just wait and see. He's going to die, and then we will be rejoicing. Imagine somebody rejoicing over your demise that you would die, and his, he's maybe imagining that his foes would be dancing around, rejoicing. That's him. He's finished with. He's done. And he says, why, I, you didn't let, Lord, you have not let my foes rejoice over me. And you know what, I think in one sense it also foreshadows Jesus Christ and his death and how the enemies, the devils, were rejoicing at the fact that Jesus was dead. But that wasn't the end of the story, was it? In verse 2 we read, O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. And so the idea is that David was obviously sick of something and it was probably something that was bringing him down into the grave he said i was getting so low so down i was at the point of death that's how close he was to dying that he says i was down there and i was about to die and you healed me i wonder how many times we have returned to give thanks for any healings that we've received have you ever received healing uh, you might say well not a divine healing but healing nonetheless right you might say well i prayed about my headache and then i went to the cupboard and found those tablets well one way or another the headache was gone okay <laughs> but you know there are times whenever god steps in miraculously and does miracle healings am i right yeah. and there are other times when he may use the medical things that are at our disposal they're available to us okay 
But do we actually give thanks for every time that God has kept us alive in our lives? See, there's all good reasons to give thanks give thanks to God. But he wasn't just said, uh, you healed me of a sore toe or you healed me of a headache. I was, he was at the point where he was dying and his foes were about to rejoice over him. And he says, oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. I mean, he's not in the grave, but it's almost, have you ever heard of the saying, one foot in the grave? You know, he's, he's looking death square in the face. He's looking at, at right in the eye and he said, I was dying. I was so low. Now, we don't know what he was dying of, but it was obviously something. I thought perhaps he was wounded in battle, whatever it was. The fact is, he was healed. And he says, you, I didn't go down into the grave. You see where it says um, the grave in one line and the next line, up from the grave. Of course, there's a song about that up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. When he's talking about the pit, He's probably not referring to death and hell and all of the things that go after that, although that could be implied. But he's really talking about the grave, first of all, because he does say the grave going down to the pit. But is there a possible further than the grave pit? Yeah? Is there somewhere where people go after death if they're in the grave and then there's also the pit? Yeah. Right? So there seems to be that in the line. But not only that, but... David is saying, you have kept me alive. Do you thank God that he's the one who's keeping you alive? He's, you're staying alive, right? You're staying alive. And it's because, I said it sort of foreshadows Jesus. He not only did die, but he came up from the grave, literally triumphed over the grave, and he's alive, and he's staying alive, and he's keeping each one of us alive. Amen. Every breath that we have is because of God is saying, I'm giving you an extra day on this planet, keeping you alive. Amen? Amen. So thank God for that. Then he says in verses uh, 4 to 5, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm sure you've heard those verses before. And people love those verses. But first of all, sing praise to the Lord. We need to. And it's not just um, one person. Because he was beginning this psalm by giving thanks. But now he wants to include not just himself but others. Say, why don't you join me in the worship and praise. Amen. It's not like I'm having a little praise party all on my own. Why not, why not tell other people what God has done in your life. And extol and thank God for his miracles, his healing, whatever he's done for you. Amen? Well, this is what he says. Sing praise. Singing is part of it. Sing praise the Lord, you saints of his. Now, let me ask you this. Now, I know it doesn't say that in the NIV. It says, you faithful people. Well, that's who the saints are, who are faithful. Who, and that's actually based on the word hasadim which means God's covenant people, based on the word hesed, which means God's covenant love, which means God is a covenant-keeping God, and we give thanks for his faithfulness. So we are also God's faithful people. But let me ask you this. How many, when it says here, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, how many of you would say that you are a saint? I know the world may point at you and say, you're no saint. Ever heard that before? He's no, he, she, no saint. Because they think of a saint as somebody in a special class, you know, who's able to answer prayers, who's dead, you know, and works miracles like Saint this and Saint that. We've got Saint Bernard, Saint Columbus, some, every other name there is out there. But are you a saint? Well, let me just remind you of a verse from 1 Corinthians, one of the best ones on this. Just to remind you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, the Corinthians were not the greatest morally. Uh, they were known for their sinfulness. Okay? But these people had become Christians. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. 
To be a saint means to be set apart, sanctified as belonging to God and his holy people. And it says it's not just you people in Corinth, but it is all who in every place call on the name of the Lord, on the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? So you are a saint. No, don't let anyone tell you you're not a saint unless you're not a saint because not all are saints. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're one of his saints. So he says, give thanks. This is back to Psalm 20, uh, 30, verse uh, four. Sing praise the Lord, you saints of his. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. That's what it says in the New King James and the King James Version. It keeps mentioning about the remembrance. How many have not got a New King James or a King James Version? It just says, give thanks to his name or for his name. Or if you have the New King James, it says, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Well, let me ask you quickly, what is the name of the Lord? What? It's all over the Bible, different names, of course, okay? But every time, and I've noticed this, you can go through your Bible and you'll see, especially here in this Psalm, since we're looking at it, that when you see the word Lord, all capitalized as in all capital letters it's signifying to you that that's the tetragrammaton tetragrammaton means the four letters yod he vav he in the hebrew which means i am the lord which is um what does it mean it says i am that i am you know the free you know when the, when moses was at the burning bush and he said God told him, you're to go and tell my people I'm going to set them free. And he says, oh yeah, I'm going to go and tell them that. Well, they're going to probably ask me, well then who is this God that spoke to you to tell them this, to, to, to set us free? Well, who, who will I say sent me? And the Lord says, you can turn to Exodus 3 uh, verses uh, 4, 13 to 15 where it says, the Lord so, said to him, I am who I am has sent to you. So you tell them, I am the sentient. That's the shortened version of it. So every time you see that, just remember, this is the, the Lord, the God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, but who says, I am who I am. That's, he says, remember his name. Now, here's a lovely phrase that you may have picked out. Maybe even some people have as a fridge magnet, okay? For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, his anger, I mean, David must have experienced some of the anger of God. In fact, this psalm seems to be saying, I, I, I experienced God's anger. That's why I was sick. That's how he interpreted it, that he thought, this is because of God's anger. He's angry at me. I don't know what I've done, but there's something I've done wrong, and he's angry at me, and I'm sick. Now, that might not be great theology from a New Testament perspective, or even from the Old Testament perspective, but the fact is, that's how David's thinking. God was angry at me. Have you ever, ever had a glimpse of the anger of God? If you ever got a glimpse of the holiness of God and the anger that God has towards sin, you'd run because you'd think, I'm scared of this God because his anger is terrible if, if you are on the receiving end of God's anger. But he says, his anger is but for a moment. However, his favor is for life. I mean, think about, I, I was thinking about this when I read it, that the moment or the night in which I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I had a glimpse of God's anger and that it, it, it had been working on me for a while actually, and been thinking about, I have to face God. How can I face this God? I was really looking at the holiness of God and thinking, how could I ever face this God? His, he would be angry at my sin. So I experienced that, but very soon that turned over as I started to experience repentance and faith and then put my trust in Christ for salvation and that moment my weeping because that's what happened weeping it all it was I was spending quite a, time, a bit of time weeping it did last for a while not all night but joy came in the morning it's as if after the darkness came the light 
Okay? I, I had the weeping. I had the mourning. I had the sadness. I had the sorrow. I faced the anger of God. But that turns around when you give your life in faith to Christ because faith comes springing out of you and you believe God has heard your prayer, that he's received you and that you have received his forgiveness. And so all of a sudden, that joy comes instead of the sadness. Isn't that right? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The night that I gave my life to Christ, I experienced such a, a feeling of terror at God, but then, boom, suddenly faith toward God. But I couldn't wait until the morning came to see, was it all a dream or was it a reality? And thank God I woke up and I had joy in the morning because I knew I really did experience salvation last night. I know I'm saved. And this is a wonderful truth. But whether it be in my case, that was to do with spiritual life. But David, I mean, he's been, he's been so down at the point of the grave, almost on a, he's on his deathbed, but he's prayed out to God, he's cried out to God, and God has turned that morning into dancing, weeping, sorry, or in, in, for the nighttime, but joy came, and he experienced the favor of God. Not just for, imagine if this was completely turned around. Imagine if you turned that verse around where it says, his favor is but for a moment, but his anger is for life. Wow. Oh my, oh, really? Gosh, that'd be a hard life to live. But it's the other way around, isn't it? He says, his anger is but for a moment. And I think that every unsaved person needs to experience the anger of God for at least a moment to get a glimpse of that. But the moment that they do, they will be converted and they will experience the favor of God. Not just, I had the favor of God for a whole day, but for life. Imagine, Imagine that. For the rest of your life, you can say, I'm under the favor of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. In verse 6 to 7, it says, Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you've made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. So here's a little bit of the backstory. David is saying, I was doing okay. Everything was going well for me. I was prospering. Everything was going well. No sickness, no trouble, no problems, no lack in my life. Everything was going well. And I started making all these faith confessions. I am great, I am strong. That was all very well when everything was going well. Okay, all these confessions. Oh yes, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Oh, that's what it says right there. And if you le read other translations, it says, uh, I should have been following the notes by the way, but I, I took a few different um, uh, translations of this. Um, when I was prosperous, I said, this is the New Living Translation, when I was prosperous, I said, nothing can stop me now. Or in the NIV, when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. See, when that sense of security and thinking, Lord, I must be doing something right because God has blessed me. It must be something I'm doing. God blessed me. I must be doing, I must be his favorite person because I have his favor after all. It lasts for life. And I must be his favorite because all these blessings are coming my way and I feel really secure. In fact, he was talking about his palace on this mountainside where he said, it is a stronghold, no one can touch me here. I'm on it, and I, as they said, as I think it's an American expression, you're on a gravy train with biscuit wheels. You, you, you're, on, you're on a slick track to going somewhere. You're on the right track, you're, do, you're, you, you're doing so well. But all of a sudden, when you're so full of yourself, Something seems wrong. My prayer life seems a bit dull. There's enough, no feeling in it at all. Something seems wrong. When I pray, it's as if the heavens are brass. What's wrong here? Ever prayed like that and said, I don't know, we're, it seems like God's not here. Maybe he's abandoned me. Maybe he hasn't, but you feel he has. And you just feel like, what, what, is there something wrong here? Because this is what David said in that psalm. He said, I, should, I was saying things like, I shall not be moved. Lord, by your favor, which we read about, you have made me, my mountain, uh, stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. See, when God is not showing up like that, 
where his presence isn't felt. Now, I know we shouldn't go by feelings, but at the same time, there is a time when God does sort of remove himself so that you would seek him. And you might say, is there something wrong? You're not talking to me? What's wrong? And then it starts to dawn on your heart. God is saying, yes, there is something wrong. You have all this about yourself, but you haven't been thinking right. Something's wrong, that's all. And so he realized, I need to repent. That's what he began to do. You know, um, even God's face, I don't know how he, it's not talking about literally God's face, but I was reminded of the story of the potter and the clay. You know, we are like pieces of clay on a potter's wheel, aren't we? And the potter is molding our lives as we turn around and around on the potter's wheel. And every once in a while we might say, I never, I don't see God's face, but I do see him every once in a while. Oh, there he is again. Oh, yeah. uh, every once in a while we do, we do see him, okay? But isn't that so? You don't, it's not like constantly, but does that mean that his eyes have been taken off of you? Does it mean that he's no longer holding you and molding you? No, but it's just that you might say, I never saw him. And, there's, and it just causes you to start to seek after God. Amen? And that's exactly what he did in verses 8 to 10. He says, I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made some my supplication. And if you want to know what that a supplication or this type of crying out was, um, well, it says here, what, he was making this sort of an argument to God. What profit is there in my blood? That's the New King James when I go down to the pit, will the, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? So he's saying, what's the point? If I die, then you're not going to get all the credit and praise that's due you. Who's going to be talking about you? Who's going to be singing your praises if I die? You see, the Old Testament saints, they did not have a full revelation of life after death, did they? As far as David was concerned, What's happening to me when I die? There's, there'll be no more praising you. But some people have taken that too far and said, see, there, was no, there is no life after death. That's just not true. David is not saying that. He just said that's the end as far as I'm concerned. But that's not the way it is in the New Testament. Did you know, and there's a couple of verses, I don't want to go into too much detail, but first of all, in the New Testament, we're told that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And in Hebrews chapter 12, we're told that there are people who are in heaven right now, not bodily, but they are the spirits of just men made perfect, and they are awaiting the resurrection of their bodies. But they're still there in the presence of God, giving thanks and, thank, uh, and, and rejoicing in God's salvation. And finally, in um, 2 Timothy 1.10, we're told this, that life and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel. Do you know what that means? It means that before this gospel came that we have, the people, especially people of the Old Testament, were not exactly clued in as to what exactly does happen after death. But when we get to the New Testament, we're given much more light and revelation that he brought not only life, but immortality, that we shall live forever. That's been brought right out into the open through the gospel. Amen? So thank God for that. And he says here, uh, let me just go through this. Uh, I'm, he's making these arguments. There's no point in me dying. And he says, hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. And it's interesting that um, in the uh, Old Testament, He's talking about the Lord to be his helper. Now, I find that interesting because in the New Testament, have you ever heard of the helper in the New Testament? Who is another helper according to the New Testament? This is a trivia question. Another helper. Yes, that's right. Because in the New Testament, Jesus is the helper, but he says, I will send you another helper. That's John chapter uh, 14 verse 16 and 15 26 I'll send you another helper so the another helper is the Holy Spirit so in the Bible all together you've got God 
probably we, we could say the Father is the helper, Jesus is the helper, and the Holy Spirit is the helper. We have God to help us in any and all our times of need. Amen. So that's what David is saying. I will give, I will speak your truth, and I will ask you to be my helper. And will he be the, uh, David's helper? Will he be our helper to the day? Amen. Okay, so finally, we come to our last two verses. And I love this one. And I suppose you all know these verses up by heart. Verses 11 to 12 says, You have turned my, for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So first of all, in the NIV it says, you've turned my wailing, it doesn't say that, wailing? Wailing, I mean, not just crying or mourning, but wailing, he must have been really crying out to God. Oh God, I'm dying here, I've got a headache. No, I'm dying here, really, I am dying. I've got one foot in the grave. And God completely turned it around so that he could say, you've turned my, for me, my mourning, my crying, my pain into dancing. Can you imagine him getting up out of his bed and starting to dance around the room? Some Christians don't like the idea of dancing in the presence of the Lord, but if you were on your deathbed and God raised you up, I think you would just say, thank God for that. You may, you might, get a bit animated and say, well, thank God, and start to rejoice like never before, would you not? You turn your, it, it, it's been turned into dancing, and you might, I was thinking when you read that this morning about, you know, David dancing before the Lord, I thought, I'm going to probably see Eddie here, he's probably going to start jumping around, dancing around all the front here, didn't happen. Anyway, but you probably do this sort of stuff at home, how many sing in the shower at home? Okay, all right, some people, they sing at home any time they can be alone just to sing but they don't want to sing in church we should be singing praise and thanking god and dancing as well is part of our christian um freedoms we include dancing and it says you you put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness well i don't know if there's anyone here who's ever worn sackcloth except if you were in a sack race you know at school you know when they had let's have a sack race but i'll tell you something this is a little secret and i've got a photograph to back it up my mother used to dress me for Sunday school, and I'm convinced it was sackcloth. She said it was tweed. But I, it was itchy all over, and I hated it. And I, I, could, I couldn't wait to get out of Sunday school and run home and rip up, just take off those Sunday clothes, kick off the Sunday shoes, and kick off my Sunday clothes, take it all off and get into my play clothes again. Okay, you know those things you wear during the week? You can, your jeans, your, your whatever, but it's just a freedom. And so here's the idea. The sackcloth represented mourning and weeping and repentance. And there is a sense in which we need to do it. You need to have a place of repentance first of all. If you said, well, oh, my Christian life has not been nothing but rejoicing. Well, what about the weeping? Was there no weeping? Was there no mourning? Was there not a time when you repented and realized? And it's not just a one time, by the way. Some people said, I repented once. Oh, wow, what, 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 when you became a Christian, is that it? Like one time repentance? I think it was Martin Luther said that our whole Christian life is a life of repentance. Because there are so many times when God brings you to a place where, and it doesn't mean to say you're getting born again, again. It doesn't mean to say you're being re-justified. It just means that you're saying, I messed up. I need to come in repentance and get right with God. So, there are many times of repentance, amen? But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there is a time, especially if, we, if you've never been a Christian, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But if you've experienced the sackcloth, not the ashes, the sackcloth and the, the pain and the repentance, then he then can turn for you that mourning into dancing and he can strip off from you the old sackcloth and clothe you with gladness. You are reclothed today, aren't you? How many of you have got a whole new set of clothes? Um, well, let me just turn to you from, for one moment to a text in Colossians. 
Because as believers, we are to put off the old and put on the new. Okay? Colossians chapter 3 and verse... I have to trust my eyesight here. Get a bit of light on it. Uh, verse 8 says this. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds but have, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and that the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful that the word of Christ dwell in you. You richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So you see there, there's a lot of putting off of the old, isn't there? Put off all those old things that you used to wear, the depression, the anxiety, the stress, those, those, are, those are the old things, okay? The, the, the things of sorrow and sadness, all the things that are listed there, lying and, and wrath and anger, all those kind of things that are listed there. I can't remember all of them actually. But there they are. Put them all off to one side and put, clothe yourself with the new things. I'm redressed. I got a new set of clothes. I'm in Christ. I'm clothed with righteousness and gladness and joy. These are my new clothes, okay? I'm not dressed like the old anymore. Amen? So let's look at that one last time. Psalm 30, closing words. Let me read that again. Verse 11. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Well, his glory there, probably referring to his heart or his soul, he's going to give thanks and his glory is going to sing from his heart. Okay? And he says in the last line, Oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Well, we said a moment ago that David was probably not aware of what happens after death. In the Old Testament, they didn't really have that full in insight. And remember what we read back in Psalm 23, verse 6. It says, That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So as far as he's concerned, I'm going to praise the Lord forever, probably meant to the, rent, to the end of my life. But there is an indication, at least, that he could have been thinking outside the box. He might have been inspired, or the scriptures are inspired to say these things, that it would be forever. Because you know what? Our life doesn't end in the grave. No matter when it happens, it's going to go on forever. And you know what? God's people are going to be praising the Lord, not just to the end of your life, but forever and forever. Amen. 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 So praise the Lord. You can be rest assured in this, that the Lord um, is able to do not only the things that David experienced, which is healing, to raise you up and to give you life and favor, but he's going to turn your situation around. Amen. Just like we saw there, he, especially when you come to Christ and experience salvation, but also Christians, we have every reason to be rejoicing and to be thankful. You know, you can be free in Christ Jesus to rejoice and praise God and sing his songs. Amen. So let's do it. Just do it. Yes. Amen. amen. So, amen. So, Nympha, are we going to do one song? There's one song that I learned when I was in the Philippines. I think Tim knows it as well, so he's going to come and sing, are you? It's called, He's Turned My Morning Into Dancing. Yes. So let's, let's stand and sing this song. Oh, Tim, 
I think you've heard this, this one, the Philippines song. He turned my morning into dancing. He turned my sorrow into joy. A song of praise and a sadness. And for the grief, the oil of joy. He turned my morning into dancing. He turned my sorrow into joy. A song of praise and a sadness. For my grief, the oil of joy, that we might be free of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified, that we might be free the planting of the Lord, that He might be. Now you want to see yourself dancing here. Set the sorrow into joy. A song of praise and set aside. And for the need of joy. That we might be the trees of righteousness. The plants in all the Lord that he might be. Glorified, we might be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be, that He might be glorified. Amen. Is there anyone dancing there today? I mean, I remember, uh, this is this is what they, they did at the church that I grew up in. Oh, the, it was like, that's dancing. Mm -hmm. That's called the Pentecostal two-step. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's not like what David did before the Lord. He was burling around, spinning, dancing, and thanking God. But we don't want to turn this place into a wild place. But at the same time, we need to be free to worship the Lord. Yeah. Amen? So listen, if you're in need this morning, let's say, for example, that you've heard that, um, that testimony of David, and you said, well, I need healing myself. You, you can cry to the Lord, but you can also come and have the eldership here of the church come and pray over you if there's anything you have need of. And if you want to talk about anything else, we're available. Okay? So God bless you today. Don't forget... There's tea and biscuits at the back. God bless. Amen.